Hey, good morning, church, and welcome to what should be our last electronic service of this pandemic season. Next week, in-person church, 10.30 a.m., May 31st. Come join us right here. Come fill these pews. Come help take care of the echo of my loud, obnoxious voice in this building when I stand right up there and share what God has put on my heart for us to hear. I will do my best to bring his word to your hearts as clearly as I can knowing that God is in control of this whole situation. I know some of you are frustrated of what's going on in our country and some of you are bothered by what's even going on in our state, but this is Memorial Day weekend. And let all of that go and do this this weekend. Instead of being bothered by what's going on in, in our community or, or in our world, be thankful for what was in the hearts of those men and women who served our country, that gave their ultimate sacrifice. They gave their life so that you and I can keep our freedoms. They gave their life so that you and I can speak out publicly. We can meet in a house of worship so that you and I can still come to Peace and Family Church and be a, a fellowship, a, a family of people who love and, and just adore spending time together and being in God's word and singing and, and, and pouring out our hearts in song to him. This is Memorial Day weekend. Please don't spend it in frustration. Spend it in thanksgiving. Spend it thanking God and, and even the families of those who have lost their loved ones defending our rights. Please, please remember the people that have given everything so that you and I can live with the freedoms that we have. With that said, be safe this weekend. I think half of Phoenix is up here right now, so be careful driving. I'm not gonna edit that out, but if you're in Phoenix and somehow you got a hold of this video, we're happy to have you, but please drive safely when you're in our town. I just heard a whole bunch of people from Payson go, uh-huh, amen. Okay, off my soapbox. I'll be up there next week preaching about who we can trust and why we can trust him. By the way, it's Jesus. Shh, don't ruin my sermon for next week by telling anybody what it's about. All right, let's get started this morning. Tony Evans is our guest pastor this morning. You know, none of these people that I borrowed their videos, okay, I stole them off the internet. None of these people that I stole their videos off the internet know that they've been our guest speaker. But if you happen to run by one of those, if you happen to be in Walmart and look, oh, there's Francis Chan, or, or oh, there's Tony Evans, or oh, there's David Platt, or oh, there's this person and that person. I saw them in our electronic church. Make sure you walk up to them and say, thank you for preaching at my church. And just watch the confused look on their face. God has been so gracious to us to allow us to still be in his word, even though we're not together. Today, Tony Evans is going to bring us some powerful understanding of what it means to be committed to God. I'm already stressed a little bit about hearing this sermon again. It just spoke to my heart. Just thinking we do, we ask God for so much, but we're so, so unwilling to give him so much. Yeah, it sounded harsh. Let me say it like this. I'll come in close because I love you and, and I want you to feel like this is personal. This is, it's just me and you. Sometimes church, sometimes we get confused in our walk with God and we think I'm going to give him the minimum he's asking for and I'm going to ask him for the maximum of what I need. And I just want you to know that there is no such thing as the minimum that God is asking for because what God asks for is our maximum. What God asks for is our fullness in commitment. I'm going to let Tony preach to you. I'm going to wait till next week before I get back on my uh, soapbox up there with my lectern teaching you. By the way, that's a lectern. Some people call it a podium, but it's not. It's a lectern. That's a weird word. All right, here we go. I know you're just seeing a pastor and get into it. I just want to be with you and you guys be here and fill these seats. We'll do it next week. Let's pray. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18. I'll give you a second to turn there before we pray. Dun, 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 dun. First Kings chapter 18. Dun, 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 dun,
Okay, I know what you're thinking. Hey, why isn't he on the worship team? He's got a great voice. I have to save it for preaching. So thank you for appreciating my dun dun duns. Okay, you should be in 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to us, to open our hearts. Let's ask God to cause us to hear him this morning. God, in all of my excitement of being so close to getting back together and being in fellowship, God, don't, don't let any of us in any of our excitement ever look over the seriousness of what it means to be in church, to be in fellowship. God, I know sometimes we make excuses. I can't go to church today or I don't want to listen to a sermon today or... I don't want to sing in the time of a vocal worship. I know that we make so many excuses, but God, I ask today that you would cause us to feel the conviction of your Holy Spirit in any area that we need to hear that we need change. God, I thank you so much that your conviction is you saying that we are weak, but you are strong, that you are saying in your weakness, child of mine, I can be your strength. God, let us understand and hear the conviction your Holy Spirit speaking to us. And let us return back to you saying, God, I ask for your strength to be who you've called me to be. God, today as Tony Evans speaks about commitment, let it be something that energizes us, that charges us to go forward in our walk, to get out of our homes, to get out of our a relaxation. God, don't let us stay idle as your people. God, let our commitment to you be full. We love you. Speak to us, mold us, change us, sanctify us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, I'll be back with you after the sermon from Tony Evans to close us out, and then we will have a worship song at the end. I'll see you in a little bit. What depression, discouragement, despair often brings is distorted information. Elijah is by himself. Depression gets worse if there's nobody in your life to change your thinking. See, if you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're talking to yourself, that's a bad conversation for yourself. You're already feeling sorry and there's nobody to talk to but you, about you, regarding you to tell you what you ought to do and you aren't in a place to even hear you correctly, then your discussion with yourself is helping yourself to become worse off about you. So God then enters the picture and tells him, Elijah, tell me how you feel. Stop talking to yourself. Because when you talk to yourself, you were getting depressed, you were suicidal, start talking to me, okay? Now I'm going to show you the wind and the rain and all that stuff. Now y'all talk to me, because you talking to you, it's killing you. Says I don't want you to kill you, stop talking you to you, and y'all talk to me. God has an angel for you, he's got a person for you, he has himself for you. He gave Elijah all three of those to give him a supernatural experience to lift him out of his depression. And one of the reasons that the church exists is to have people available in your life when you are down who can embrace you, minister to you, lift you up, and he can use you to do the same thing for somebody else. Because when we are depressed, we need another perspective. That doesn't deny the reality of how we feel. But what it does, it doesn't let you live there. Israel is dealing with a problem that brought the prophet Elijah on the scene in the first place. And that is their attraction to idols. They were attracted to Baal and Asherah, Baal's girlfriend, the idols that had now consumed the culture, even those who named the name of God. We've defined an idol already, but just so that we review, an idol is an unauthorized noun, person, place, or thing that you look to to get a need met. 
It's an unauthorized person, place, or thing, an unauthorized noun that you look to for that thing to be the source of a need being met. Something God has not approved, but you're looking to it to be the source of your provision. That's an idol. Granted, we over here don't worship trees by and large or the moon or the stars. Well, I can't really say that because folks are still checking their horoscopes as an unauthorized source. Because the Bible says when you, when you check astrology to find your source and your direction based on the movement of the stars or the month you were born or any of the like, you have appealed to an unauthorized source to be the definition of your needs being met and the definition of your identity. So that is idolatry. So you may not do any of the things people may do. You just, you just have an American idol. You just look at what's happening in the culture and you gravitate to that, whether it's people or power or possessions or whether it's prestige, whatever it is, you are looking to that thing as the source of your provision. Now, when you understand that is the biblical definition of idolatry, then you understand that uh, you can be right here, right now, today, and be an idol worshiper. Because while you're sitting in church, God is not your source. He's a point of reference, but he's not your source. And so we have seen some of the supernatural activity of Elijah, and we've tried to say this transfers over to you today. The principle of God's supernatural work that we're discovering in his life relates to your life. We come in chapter 18, and we come to a place where now the prophet Elijah confronts King Ahab. He confronts King Ahab and he confronts him in chapter 18, verse 17. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? In other words, you getting on my nerves, Ahab says. Is this you? Elijah, you bring in all this trouble to Israel. Elijah responds in verse 18, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have because you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. You followed the idols. Elijah is not concerned about being politically correct. So he refuses to be politically correct. He says, Ahab, you have brought this about because of your pursuit of idolatry. You've caused the heavens to shut up. It's no longer raining. The culture's in trouble because you have pursued another God. One of the reasons you're seeing all of this chaos around us, even in our culture and in our country, is because we have forsaken the Lord our God. And what you and I are experiencing today is God saying, you don't want me? Let me get out of the way and let me show you life without me. And so you have the consequence of the removal of God. God is being removed from government. God is being removed from schools. God is being removed from the biblical definition of marriage. God is being removed from the civics. God can't even open up a prayer at a football game. When God is being removed from the culture, that means idolatry has automatically set in, which means there are consequences that accrue in the environment where God has been removed. And that is what was happening in Israel. They're experiencing life without the one true God. So, Elijah says, Now send and gather to me all of Israel at Mount Carmel. Verse 19 together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, that's 850, who eat at Jezebel's table. He says, uh, okay, uh, let's, have a, let's have a fight at the OK Corral. Okay, you bring your people and your God and I'll be there at high noon, okay? Okay, let, let's settle this once and for all. Let's don't, let's don't confuse people. Let's, let's put this thing out on the table. 
So Ahab says, okay, you got a deal. Let's go for it. So Ahab sent, verse 20, a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Now watch this because this is where we start. Verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Oh. Elijah says, all right, folk, how long you gonna keep dancing? How long will you hesitate between two opinions? The word hesitate means vacillate. How long you gonna dance? This God on Sunday and another God on Monday. How long you gonna go back and forth? How long, how long you gonna, you gonna dance around this thing? How long you gonna move back and forth? How long are we going to have to keep doing this? How long are you going to have to keep hearing the same sermon every week calling you to full commitment before you make one? See, a lot of folk want to worship God on Sunday and then hug an idol on Monday. He says, how long? How many more years? How many more months? How many more services? How long are you going to dance before you decide? That's his question. It says the people were silent. Why were they silent? Simple. They weren't ready to commit. They weren't ready to commit. They weren't ready to, well, well, you know, you know, you're too serious. You, you, you being too serious about this Christian thing. Just let me get in a little church, give me a little music, preach me a little sermon, and then leave me alone. It says the people were silent. They were not ready to commit. But watch it. They were always ready for a miracle. They were always looking for a blessing. They were always looking for God to do something while they were silent. So let me state my position as coming from this passage. If you're not ready to commit and to stop dancing, stop looking for a miracle and searching for a blessing. They said nothing because they weren't ready to make a full commitment. And yet he's calling on them just to do that. So now, Elijah says, I alone, verse 22, am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Elijah says, I'm outnumbered, 450 to one. Since this is not... <laughs> to see what the, how the numbers fare in my favor, I'm ready to take my stand. God is looking for some folk who even though outnumbered are willing to take their stand. Who even though the other side has more than you, even though it looks like you're outnumbered in your, among your friends, among your coworkers or what have you, he said, this is how the numbers shape up. But in spite of that, we're gonna put the true God to the test. He says, why don't you bring, verse 23, two oxen and let the 450 choose one oxen and I'll take whichever one they don't choose, put it on the wood, put it on the altar, but don't put a fire under it. And then you 450, you call on the name of your God and tell your God, light the fire, okay? Tell your God, be the Ohio players, fire. Tell your God to light it up. And then I'm going to call on my God. And let's see whose God is the God of fire. Now, unless you understand Baalism, you can't appreciate this, but Baal was the God of fire, the God of the sun. So you figure if Baal is in charge of the sun, he can light something up. So he's challenging him at the very core of the greatness of their God. Says, let's see what your God can do. 
So they agree. He is so confident in his commitment to God that he will challenge the majority. Oh, do we need some committed Christians today who are so committed and so confident in their God, they don't mind being outnumbered. Because they understand that once God, the true God is in the equation, the numbers shift. So he says, come on, let's don't talk. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. And so here's what they do. The 450 agree. And so they chose the ox in verse 26. They took the ox and prepared it in the name of Baal. And from morning to evening, they were saying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped about the altar, which they made. So they're in there with their God. Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, let's have some fire. Light the, light the altar. Oh, Baal, oh, great Baal. They jumping around the altar. They're getting their praise on around the idol. And, and it says, and nothing happened. And there was no voice. Now, this is where we get to a little humorous part in the Bible. It gets a little humorous here in verse 27. Because it says, at about noon, that Elijah mocked them. Okay, now it's 450 of them. And it's one of you, this ain't the time to be making fun of folk. But Elijah just standing there and he mocks them and look at how he mocks them. He says, why don't you, why don't you call out louder? Uh, call out verse 27 with a loud voice. Y'all ain't screaming loud enough. He can't hear you. He says, um, uh, but he is a God. Uh, maybe he's occupied. Okay? He's got another meeting going on and he can't get to y'all right now. So maybe that's why nothing happening. Or maybe he's gone aside. Now, gone aside means maybe in the bathroom. <laughs> gone aside means he's doing number two. That's what gone aside means. Or maybe he hasn't gone aside. Uh, maybe he's on a journey. He's on a trip. You know, he's taking a vacation. Or perhaps he's snoring. He says, maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up. So why don't you sing a little louder, praise a little louder, pray a little louder and wake up your God. Well, all he did was tick them off because in verse 28 it says, they crowd out with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to the custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. When midday was past, verse 29, they raved until the evening sacrifice. There was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come close. Come close. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Okay, let me stop there. Let me stop there. It says he repaired the altar which had been torn down. That means they had religion without commitment because the altar hadn't been used. Now what would they do on the altar? Sacrifices. Why would they make sacrifices? To deal with sin. So what they were doing was having religion without dealing with sin. They did not want to deal with the spiritual realities in their lives because Baal let them go where they wanted to go, do what they wanted to do, act what they wanted to act. Baal did not put any boundaries or restrictions on them. And that's not the God they wanted all week. That's good enough for Sunday. Now give me my six days but they wanted that God to be the God of the supernatural. So the altar was left unattended. The spiritual issues were not addressed, but yet they had enough religion to claim God. You ought to be tired of religion by now. 
Religion can't change you, religion can't help you, and religion certainly won't bring heaven down to earth. What you need, and I need, and we need is a relationship, but you can only have a relationship on God's terms, and you can't have a relationship on God's terms if you got another God waiting for you tomorrow. That is another source of your identity and your reality. And so, Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So the prophet comes along, and here's what happens. He took the 12 stones, verse 32. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He got the spiritual priority back in order. And unless we do that as a church, unless that's the main thing, every other thing is a waste of time. He got the altar back, the spiritual part back, the confession of sin and the pursuit of righteousness back. The altar represented all that. And then he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. So he digs this hole around the altar. Now watch what he does here. He arranges the wood, verse 33, cuts the ox in the pieces, lays it on the wood, and he said, fill four pitches with water and pour it on the burnt offering. Now wait a minute. If you're trying to light up something, you don't pour water on it. You're not trying to pour water on it. You want to keep it dry so that it lights quickly. But he pours water on it. Oh, but that's not all he does. Because according to verse 24, it says, he says, do it a second time. So they pour water on it, they wet the wood, wet the ox, wet everything. He says, pour four more pitches on it. So war, okay, he does it again. Oh, but is he finished? No, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So he prays. And he prays at the evening sacrifice, O Lord, verse 36, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant-keeping God, Today, let it be known that you are God in Israel. I am your servant, and notice this, I have done all the things at your word. Let it be known what you will do when people are committed to you and your word. In other words, I'm not like y'all, I ain't dancing. I'm not like y'all, I'm not going back and forth. I am totally committed to his word. That's how you know if you're dancing or not. He says, let it be known that I'm for real because I obey your word. In other words, God, your word has the final say-so over my decisions. Until you get to that place, you're not fully committed. If you're not fully committed, you have limited or lost access to the miraculous. So, he says, I have kept your word. Answer me, O Lord, verse 37, that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water in the trench. Now, this is one of the scenes I want to see on instant replay when I get to heaven. Because it not only said the fire fell, but it says it consumed the stones the wood and the stone. But here's the part I like. It said it licked up the water around the trench. Oh, and when you see God show off and show out for you, when you see him do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, when you see because you've rebuilt the altar of full commitment, he said he saw it. <laughs> and then the people saw it. They fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Does anybody here know what a um, hillbilly road bump is? A hillbilly road bump is an armadillo dead in the middle of a road. That, that's what's called a hillbilly, I mean, country people call it a hillbilly road bump, okay? Now, let me explain. One half a million armadillos every year are killed in the middle of the road. Every time I've seen an armadillo, it's on its back and its legs is sticking up in the air. Every time I see an armadillo, it's dead in the middle of the road. Because here's what they do. They start crossing the road. 
They stop in the middle of the road. They, they stop in the middle of the road with cars coming. They stopping in the middle of the road with cars coming and they get run over. They get run over because they get comfortable in the middle of the road. Does God have any hillbilly road bump Christians in this place? Does God have any hillbilly road bump Christians? You come to church and you stay in the middle. You like Malcolm in the middle. You stay in the middle. You want to be able to step over here to the God of the Bible, but you want to stay over here to the world. You stay in the middle only to be run over by his glory when he moves down the center. But if he can ever get you to go all the way, heaven will open up. You will see heaven open, Jesus said. You will see the angels of God going up and down the Son of Man and you will see what God can do because you've given him all you have. God is looking for some folk who are going to leave the middle and go all the way. The dominant sin spoken of in the Bible is idolatry. All through scripture you see God's hatred of idolatry. Idolatry is any unauthorized noun, person, place, thing, or thought that you look to as your source because that means you're committed to a false God. There's only one true God, the God of the Holy Scriptures, who's revealed himself both in creation and in his word. And he does not want any competing loyalties in our lives. He wants us totally committed to the one true God. The moment you bring another God, another noun, person, place, thing, or thought, that you look to as your ultimate source, you've created divine competition. You've created a, a deity competitor. And nothing will drive God from you in terms of you experiencing his presence in your life like you inviting another God into the vicinity. Whether that God is money, or whether that God is even religion, whether that God is education, whether that God is career, well, you can name it. But once that thing or person becomes your source, ah, God is angry with that and will display the weakness of your God because he'll, he'll interrupt your God to let you know that God wasn't as big, powerful, as uh, uh, authoritative as you thought it was when you put your whole life into that God's hands. So there must be a decision that we must all make, even as Christians, that there will be no other God before us. You know, that goes back to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God before me. In fact, God wants to be so alone as God, he won't even let you take a picture of himself creating an image because he does not want us to dumb down how awesome a God he is. Stay committed to the one true God because there's only one true God who deserves that commitment. Wow, that was a great word. What a challenge. Committed to God. Do you understand? Do we even understand what that means? <clears throat> if you look back in Genesis and into the garden, you will understand what commitment to God brings from God. It's kind of a spiritual mathematical equation that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. They were committed to him. He was committed in fullness of his presence with them. But here's what happened when that commitment changed. They were cast out of the garden. That's what sin, that's what lack of commitment does in your life and in my life. It's not that we are separated from God for eternity, but we're separated from the fullness of his presence because we brought something else into that presence and he's not going to share it. Church, you and I need to understand that God has called us. God has called us to give our fullness of commitment to him because that's what brings the fullness of his presence upon us. Please, church, let's make sure that we're not trying to do some kind of minimum to get by so that we can call ourselves a Christian. That because we've given our lives to Jesus, that's enough. And, and, and now we're, we're going to church when we can. We're opening the Bible when we can. We're supporting God's ministry when we feel like it. 
Church, please understand this, that God has called us to give all of us to him. He's given everything so that we can have his everything. And if you want the fullness of God, I'll tell you it comes in the fullness of a commitment. So if God has spoken to your heart today, please allow that conviction to be something that you surrender that weakness to God. Let him be your strength. See, God doesn't want to be pushy. God wants to be invited. There's a part of scripture in Numbers chapter six. Turn there really quick. No, I'm not gonna get into another sermon, but I want you to turn to Numbers chapter six really quick. I'm gonna do my singing again. Numbers chapter six. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 okay, you should be there. I know I got a great voice. Just text Frank. Hey, Frank, why isn't Pastor on the worship team? And then when he sends you back a text that is just, what? Have you heard him saying? Just understand that I really don't have a great voice. All right, Numbers chapter six. There is a group of people that are called to give a commitment to God. They're called Nazarites. And, and, and Nazarites are throughout scripture, but this is really where we get the first picture of it. That if you're going to make the commitment, take the vow of a Nazarite, you're going to live like this. That you're going to give up of these things of the world and that you're going to take on not worrying about your appearance. And it's going to be specific. So people say, oh, that's a Nazarite. Most of them, most of them, men and women, people who took the vow of a Nazarite, it was for a season. It was for a time that they needed to update or, or be critical personally of their commitment and, and make sure that they're dedicated. Now, there's some Nazarites that, that went through their whole life with this vow. You know, if you look at uh, Samuel, if you look at, oh, who was that dude with the really long hair? That's right, Samson. You look at these people, John the Baptist. Some of these people lived as a Nazarite their whole life. But this was a part of scripture, Numbers chapter six, you look at it and you think, oh, wow, that's what it was like back then to be committed. Well, yeah, that's what it was like back then to be committed. God has called them to a commitment to be this way. But if you go to the end of chapter six, it's an amazing part of scripture. Let me grab my Bible. Always be prepared. I should have had the Bible in my hand already. There you are. I should have had the Bible in my hand already. I apologize. Numbers chapter six, you get this reading and you get this understanding of look at that vow. God has truly called us to be fully committed to him from the beginning. But it's not so that he can say, look what I made my people do. Here's the mathematical spiritual equation. God says, when you fully commit yourself to me, I commit to fully being a part of your life. See, church, we can't commit to God so that we can get things from it. We commit to God because we get God. You look at the end of it, God talks to Moses. You look starting in verse 22. God talks to Moses there in Numbers chapter six, tells him, hey, you speak to Aaron and you put this blessing out and you verbally say this to the nation of Israel. And here's what a full commitment of God to us looks like. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That is a great blessing. But look at that next verse. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. It's a twofer. When we put the name upon God on our life, when we give our fullness to God, when we are committed to God in such a way that the world sees it, that they see God in us, we know that's the fullness of our commitment. And then we get the fullness of God on our lives. God wants you to commit to him because God wants to be fully a part of you. It's about love. It's about grace. It's about forgiveness. That story of Elijah wasn't about, hey, let me prove something. It was about, let me show you something. My fullness to a fully committed person. My full presence, my full power, 
God speaking, my full ability, my full sovereignty upon the life of someone who's fully committed to me. This side of the cross, we have everything. We not only have the fullness of God as a Christian, but we have the fullness and the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about trusting Jesus. We look at this whole world and people who think they have authority. But when we fully commit to God, we understand we get the fullness of his presence. And that's the one we can fully trust. I'm going to leave you and dismiss you with this song. Man, this song is powerful. It is the ironic, ironic, Aaron. It is the ironic blessing in song. I'm not going to lie. It made me cry. This song is so powerful. And today, as I was getting ready to put it as a part of this video series here of our last electronic service of this pandemic season, I found another version of it where the world has chimed in to be a part of this proclamation. Church is powerful. Keep your Bible open there to Numbers chapter six, because at the end of it, you'll understand this is what we're singing about. We fully commit to God and he fully gives his presence and blessing back to us. If you feel distant from God, look for something that might be in the way. God won't share the limelight, but he also won't withhold his presence to those who seek his face. I love you. I'm going to dismiss you into a time of worship. I will see you in person next week.